common cause of acute abdomen in emergency units with an incidence of about 20 per thousand pregnancies. It is still the leading cause of pregnancy-related maternal death in the first trimester and accounts to about 4 to 10 percent of all pregnancy-related deaths. And 6 to 10 percent of all pregnant women who go to an emergency department with first trimester bleeding, pain, or both have an ectopic pregnancy. Now, the first week of pregnancy is the decisive time regarding ectopic. You can see here the journey of the fertilized egg through the tube into the cavity of the uterus, and it undergoes multiplication and growth during this journey. We have many different sites of ectopic pregnancy. In one series of 1,800 surgically treated cases, the distribution was as follows here, 70% ampullary, 12% ischemic, 11 fimbrial, 3.2 ovarian, 2.4 interstitial, and 1.3% abdominal. I hope to take you to each of these locations with clinical examples. What is the cause of ectopic pregnancies? The most common extrauterine pregnancy location is the fallopian tube, which accounts to 98% of all ectopic pregnancies. And the reason for this location is very often a disruption of the normal tubal anatomy, which is caused by pelvic inflammatory disease, surgery, congenital anomalies, or tumors. This anatomic distortion leads to damaged ciliary activity and causes an impaired tubal function. And this leads to the ectopic implantation of the fertilized egg. High risk factors for ectopic pregnancy include previous ectopic surgery, tubal surgery, in utero, DES, DHU still stored exposition, which is certainly something belonging to the past, and intrauterine conception, intrauterine contraceptive devices. Clinical signs of ectopic pregnancy are known as secondary amenorrhea, vaginal spotting, and low abdominal pain, but these clinical signs are not always true. Therefore, we need essential tools to verify the diagnosis, and these tools are transvaginal ultrasound or serum beta HCG, or both. Let's first talk about the beta HCG. It's a glycoprotein produced by a placental trophoblast. From day eight post-conception, the blood levels climb 1.7 times within 24 hours in a normal pregnancy. Only five to eight percent of all ectopic pregnancies present with a viable embryo and normal levels of serum beta HG. All others show suboptimal beta HG levels. Now let's look at ultrasound. We have coined an expression, discriminatory zone. And this means that at a serum beta HG level of 1,500 milliunits per milliliter, which is usually at day 10 to 14 post-conception in a normal pregnancy, we should see with transvaginal ultrasound an intrauterine chorionic sac by means of a of a TVS probe which operates with 5 megahertz or more. For transabdominal ultrasound, this discriminatory zone is higher. It's about 6,500 milliunits per milliliter. The chorionic sac is visible at 4.5 to 5 weeks with a double echogenic ring around the hypoechoic gestational sac. Eccentric 
embedding in decidua. And we can see the so-called comet sign, which I'm going to show you. The York sign is visible only after completed five weeks. The comet, comet sign was uh, an expression which was coined by Professor Koyak. Um, it shows in a normal implantation the trophoblast, peritrophoblast flow around the double echogenic rings which stand for the implanted gestation. This, gest uh, this uh, comet sign is visible at 4.5 to 5 weeks. You can see here the double echogenic ring and the peritrophoblast flow around it, standing for beginning of intervillous circulation. Even in an ectopic implantation, we can see changes in the uterine and endometrial vascularity with increased vascularity and decreased resistance to flow. Outside of the uterus, we might see so-called ring of fire. This ring of fire is the vascularization of the corpus luteum, standing for the very active endocrinological function of this uh, organ, which supports the pregnancy until six weeks. 90% of all ectopic pregnancies are close to the corpus luteum gaviditatis, and therefore the corpus luteum might be taken as a landmark to lead us to the detection of the ectopic pregnancy. The ectopic pregnancy as well is the so-called ring of fire. You can see here both rings of fire right next to each other. On the left side, the corpus luteum, and on the right side, a viable ectopic pregnancy. In power doppler, the situation is as well, can be as well demonstrated. On the right side, you can see the embryonic heart action. Niche mode, Another possibility which has come to us with three-dimensional ultrasound allows us to verify the anatomic conditions here. We can see clearly that the topic pregnancy is far away from the ovary. We can see the organ boundaries by this 3D <coughs> An ectopic presence, uh, uh, pregnancy can present in different ways. It can present as a viable embryo, only in 10%, as a blighted ovum in 40%, and as questionable as Nexa in 50%. I would like to begin with a blighted ovum. We can see in color and power doppler, randomly dispersed multiple small vessels within the adnexa. The characteristic feature is if we switch on pulse wave doppler and analyze the spectrum of the flow, then we can see that the resistance index is very low. Uh, it is around 0.42 and lower. This is a diagnostic sign not only for malignancies, but also for the typical peritrochoblastic flow of the ectopic pregnancy. If we go to the questionable adnexa, we see here a case of hemoperitoneum. We can see the amorph masses next to the adnexa standing for the uh, hematoperitoneum on the right side, and laparoscopy uh, is, was indicated here and showed the 
situation very clear. There are also different forms, rare forms of ectopic pregnancy, uh, those pregnancies which are not to be found in the tube but in other locations. One of these rare forms is the chronic ectopic pregnancy. This pregnancy is located in the tube, but it is characterized uh, by eventually even negative beta HG levels. And if we remove this nexal mass, histology will show us so-called ghost villi, uh, which show no non-active trophoblast structures in this fallopian tube. The clinic is especially if it is uh, better HG negative, very difficult these patients travel from one doctor to the other until someone decides to do laparoscopy. Ovarian ectopic pregnancies occur once in 7,000 pregnancies and make up about 3, 3 to 5% of all ectopic pregnancies. You can see here on the right side the ovary with an adherent clot together with free fluid in the part of Douglas. The laparoscopic picture shows us after removal of the blood clot from the ovary, the lesion on the ovary. I would like to come to the uterine ectopic pregnancies and we have here the corneal or interstitial pregnancy and the cervical ectopic pregnancy. The interstitial pregnancy accounts for up to 1 to 3 percent of all ectopic pregnancies. The interstitial portion of the fallopian tube is the section of the tube which is surrounded by myometrium, the corneal area. If a pregnancy implants here is called interstitial or corneal pregnancy. 3D ultrasound can help us to find out that this pregnancy is not within the endometrium. We can see here on the right side a demarcation between the gestational sac and the endometrium. And this demarcation uh, can only be found if we navigate through the planes of the volume. If we find it, it's a clear proof that we are looking at an interstitial pregnancy. Otherwise, we see, we see a very thin uh, myometrium here and this very thin myometrial mantle uh, heralds the consequences of such a location. You can also appreciate by color Doppler the enormous vascularity around this ectopic pregnancy because uh, the uterine artery and the branch of the ovarian uh, artery uh, provide this ectopic pregnancy with an immense uh, flow. We had this case and we did a laparoscopy after it became clear that there is an imminent risk of rupture. You can see here on the left side the, uh, the left horn of the uterus, which is very, very dominant here, and you can see the vascular uh, structures on its surface. These are, this is the anatomic substrate of the color doppler picture, which you saw before. A slight touch with the laparoscopic instrument caused a rupture of the horn, and you can see here the embryo protruding from the rupture, side of rupture. We removed the whole uh, area here, sutured it, and uh, the result was a unicornial uterus, 
but an organ which was still fit to host another pregnancy. Now, survival is not a pregnancy. It accounts to 1 in 10 to 15,000 of all ectopic pregnancies. You can see here a three-dimensional picture. This is the isthmus of the uterus, and here the corpus. This is the cervix, and this is the site of the implantation. Cervical ectopic pregnancies have their very special problems. The delayed diagnosis will lead to a trophoblast invasion of the cervical wall right next to the area where the implant artery is joined. And if we make a wrong diagnosis, like cervical abortion, and we try to help the patient by removing the remainings of the pregnancy, we might cause an emergency situation which leads to a hysterectomy. So sonomorphology of the cervical ectopic is very important. We need to see the homogene deciduous reaction. We need to see the closed inner cervical os, which makes a difference to the cervical abortion. And we see a round gestational sac, which signalizes signalizes the healthy situation of the ectopic pregnancy. 60% of all survival ectopic pregnancies are viable, which is probably due to the excellent vascular supply at the level of the uterine arteries. And therefore, we find very often normal serum beta HGGs, the York sac, and an embryonic heart uh, on this image. another cervical ectopic pregnancy. You can see here the isthmus and the embryo here in the York sac in the cervix. It is very important to diagnose cervical ectopic before 12 weeks of gestation because conservative therapy works only in cases diagnosed before 12 weeks. This is due to the trophoblast invasion of the cervical wall, which will be resistant to any methotrexate therapy after 12 weeks. If we manage to have an early diagnosis, we can treat the patient with serial methotrexate injections, if necessary, uterine artery embolization, intracervical prostaglandine injection, ligation of the uterine arteries, and of course, before we do DNE, we have to have enough of cross-matched blood. The differential diagnose would be the cervical abortion. We can see here the inner cervical os, which is not intact. It has been opened. And the aborted trophoblast material in the cervical canal. There's also no vascularity in this area. Only the descending branches of the uterine arteries are to be seen. Sometimes it may be difficult to differentiate a cervical pregnancy from a supracervical, from an isthmic pregnancy. But the level of the inner cervical os will help us. And three-dimensional ultrasound, again, is very helpful in this situation. If we draw the line in the level of the inner cervical os, we can clearly make the diagnosis. To summarize cervical ectopic, it is associated with high mobility, has the potential for massive hemorrhage, of course, the mortality is low due to early ultrasound diagnosis using transvaginal examination. Metotrexate can prevent hysterectomy in 91% if given early enough. And the treatment of choice in the second trimester is 
hysterectomy. Now another rare form, becoming less rare every year. This is the cesarean scar ectopic pregnancy. The site of nidation is the triangle, fluid filled triangle, uh, which we see very often after cesarean uh, sections. And we see it more often in retroflected uterine. This is the site where the cesarean scar pregnancy implants. It is not possible that this pregnancy can go to term. The current range is 1 in 1,800 to 1 in 2,216 of normal pregnancies. More than half of the reported cases have prior cesarean deliveries, and the mean gestational age at diagnose is 7.5 weeks. Most frequent symptom, painless vaginal bleeding. 112 cases of cesarean pregnancies were presented in a paper and expected management of six patients resulted in uterine rupture requiring hysterectomy in three patients. Dilatation and curettage was associated with severe maternal morbidity like massive hemorrhage. So basically it applies to the cesarean scar pregnancy the same as to the cervical pregnancy. Transvaginal ultrasound is highly accurate in detecting the cesarean scar hysterotomy pregnancy. And um, as I told you before, the cesarean scar defect is uh, a small cavity um, filled with fluid, most common after multiple cesarean deliveries. The data which are now available suggest that termination of pregnancy is the treatment of choice in the first trimester, soon after the diagnosis, and here, some more 3D pictures of cesarean scar pregnancy. You can see on the right side the enormous vascularity around this pregnancy and uh, the consequences of any attempt to terminate such a pregnancy by DNE are clear, uh, and it is also clear what will happen if such a pregnancy site ruptures. 3D color Doppler and power Doppler are therefore very important for the quantification of the neovascularization in this area, and it helps us to make the proper decision regarding uh, the tools which we use how to handle this case, whether we use uterine artery ligation or embolization. In our case, we uh, used laparoscopic minimal invasive surgical treatment, beginning with a ligation clipping of the uterine arteries on both sides, and then opening the cesarean scar and removing the trophoblast material. This is the post-operative, uh, the picture at the end of the operation, and on the right side you can see the completely decreased vascularity two days after surgery. I would like to uh, give you a case report, if the time allows it, of an abdominal pregnancy with implantation in the peritoneal cavity, which is very rare. The estimated incidence is one per 10,000 births, and it makes 1.4% of all ectopic pregnancies. This patient presented with a seeming trophoblast flow, and we interpreted this as an incomplete miscarriage, and the patient was treated with DNE. 
She presented five days later with acute abdomen in the emergency unit. And there was lots of free fluid in the part of two class in the sense of a hemoperitoneum. And the radiologist found a viable fetus under the liver. Laparotomy was immediately prepared. You see on the left side here the three-dimensional workup, which was a bit difficult of the fetus here. And if you look closely, you can see something here. On the right side, you will see the intraoperative fetus with the gestation and sac, and the gallbladder and the liver. After opening the sac, we removed the fetus, and the fetus turned out to have an ortholocele as well. Another rare ectopic pregnancy, form of ectopic pregnancy, is the bilateral tube ectopic pregnancy. And this happens once in 200,000 pregnancies, or once in 1,500 ectopic pregnancies. It is more common after clomiphene or gonadotropine stimulation. And it is important to keep in mind as clinical sign that the serum beta-HG levels develop controversial to clinical expectations. This patient showed the first time with a serum beta-HG of 2,624, four days prior to admission and on admission with lowered suboptimal beta HG level of 1847 milliunits per milliliter. And laparoscopy was performed <coughs> with partial right side injectomy. Histopathology confirmed the tumor ectopic pregnancy on the right side. However, two weeks later, the patient returned with beta HG of now 4,988, abdominal pain and free fluid in the Morrison pouch. HD was 9.5%. Of course, nobody was so uh, quick to immediately do a laparoscopy because nobody thought of a bilateral ectopic pregnancy. So she went for <clears throat> CT, and CT provided us with evidence of another ectopic pregnancy on the left side. She had a hemoperitoneum of 1,500 milliliter. This is the first incident, right side, and here you see the second incident on the left side, open surgery, and the left isthmic tubal rupture. Three possible explanations for this bilateral tubal ectopic. Either simultaneous multiple ovulation with implantation at different sites or sequential implantation of two fertilized eggs. Here a graph showing the surprising development of the beta HG levels. Another very rare form is a viable twin ectopic pregnancy. Twin ectopic pregnancy occurs, uh, has been described only in a hundred cases worldwide so far. And the unilateral twin ectopic gestation is estimated to occur once in 200 ectopic preg pregnancies. You can see here the implantation site outside of the uterus with two yaw sacs. And the sonographic work up shows that next to each yaw sac is a small embryo with part action. This is the uterus showing strong endometrial reaction 
to the ectopic pregnancy and hormone situation. Take home message what is that ectopic pregnancies still remain a serious and life threatening condition. With transvaginal ultrasound alone, the diagnosis could be missed. Therefore, we have to use serum beta HG in unclear adnexal masses. If in doubt, we have to do serial follow ups of both ultrasound and beta HG levels. Careful diagnostic evaluation of the ectopic pregnancy is required to recognize the exact localization. 3D color and power doppler help us to determine the anatomy and intensity of neovascularization. IVF and increased numbers of cesarean section contribute to occurrence of uterine ectopic pregnancies. Treatment options include methotrexate, uterine artery embolization, and minimal invasive laparoscopic surgery. And misjudgment of uterine ectopic pregnancies can lead to catastrophic developments and hysterectomy. Thank you very much.